Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fourth in our series of the Presidential Dialogue Across Different Series. I'm delighted to welcome you to our Germantown campus, and let me start off by thanking all of the people who make that happen, our folks here on this campus, our MCTV, and those also in my office who work diligently to create an experience for us tonight. Difference can take many forms, racial and ethnic difference, religious difference, national difference. Oftentimes, there's a combination of all three. When I was a child, we talked about America as a melting pot. Then there was the toss salad metaphor, and then there became the ethnic stew. I'm not quite sure what the most recent saying is at this time, but it was common in all of these metaphors is diversity in the same shared space. Questions of assimilation or cultural competence will always be salient questions in the United States. We are truly an extraordinary nation in the depth of our diversity. Whatever metaphor we use in a pluralistic society, difference will always be present. And difference itself is not a monolithic category. Language may inflect how religious traditions are passed down, from one generation to next, an ethnic background may determine which languages are actually used. National identity may frame racial identity in distinct ways. For people who are in the minority in some way, ethnic, religious, or linguistic, being different has had distinct impacts on their lived experience. The process of defining oneself as different can become a source of pride, but it can also become a source of vulnerability. When there are hostilities in the wider community, like racism or xenophobia, or when a person is very young or does not have support from a community, both of our speakers tonight have experiences with these topics, have lived with difference, and built a significant awareness of it. Iman Yaye Hindi from working in the community and with students, and Mr. Neil Saxena from working with youth in the Asian American LEAD program. Each of them has contributed much to our local community's understanding of difference. Iman Hindi and his teaching and conversations about Islam for over 15 years, and Mr. Saxena through his work with youth on cultural identity in Asian Americans. They have faced these questions of difference and cultural assimilation in many ways head on. Now, I don't want to argue with anyone about having a monopoly about how one understands diversity. We're all vulnerable to seeing only the picture from the angle which with we sit. We also suffer from cultural biases ourselves, which, which includes our excuse me, complete understanding of the complexities of difference. After 9-11 in particular, I think more people who were born inside of the United States started to ask questions about what we can learn across difference and how we can best learn it. Each of our guests tonight has done some extraordinary work in their communities, in our communities, in helping us address these challenges. They have been teachers and guides in very delicate and important journeys, and I really want to commend them for their tirelessness and their ability to build conversations around difference. Civility is a feature that has characterized both of their work and which has inspired me to invite them here today. I hope they can lead us tonight to explore some facets of difference more closely and share perhaps some of their secrets for staying in balance through such conversations. Now I've asked one of our very special faculty members to do introductions tonight. Dr. Durrani has taught engineering, physics, and astronomy at the college for seven years. Not only is he an extraordinary faculty member, in fact, he was just awarded one of our outstanding part-time faculty recognitions this year. He is also a faculty advisor to the Muslim Student Association at Montgomery College. In this capacity, he has been an invaluable resource to the college and to me personally, as we have worked to support our Muslim students, faculty, and staff. He has also been a guide for our Muslim students and their supporters, 
and what has been an unsettling political and social time for many of us. Dr. Durrani is the kind of faculty member that makes Montgomery College truly extraordinary. He combines his love of engineering and teaching with a commitment to students that extends outside of the classroom. Thank you, Dr. Durrani, for your dedication to our college and to civil dialogues. And I invite you to come and introduce our guest this evening. Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, in the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum. May peace be with all of you, and I want to include myself as well. Uh, in the Holy Quran, God says, uh, dealing kindly and justly with all, for God loves those who are just. It's directly from chapter 60, verse 8. One of the functions of Islamic law is to protect the privileges, the privileged status of minorities. History provides many examples of Muslim tolerance towards other faiths. Today's conversation is the last of a series of conversations that were led by Montgomery College President, uh, Dr. Pollard, and I'm highly encouraged that Montgomery College, under the leadership of Dr. Pollard, is having these civil discourses, especially in a time where many minorities are uncertain of their safety. These conversations help us to see across differences, especially in an educational environment such as our great Montgomery College. On a personal note, Dr. Pallad has been most sensitive to the condition of all minorities on all campuses, especially to the Muslim students, staff, and faculty of Montgomery College, and minorities elsewhere as well, by enthusiastically embracing radical inclusivity. We have seen a more than 50% increase in anti-Muslim bias incidences in 2016, over the previous year, the National Organization CARE has a new report titled The Empowerment of Hate, which outlines how the increase in anti-Muslim bias incidences has been accompanied by a similar spike in anti-Muslim hate crimes during the same period. In addition to Muslims, other American minorities have also been marginalized and have been the victims of hate crime. In today's conversations, we are honored by our two guests, Mr. Neil Saxena and Imam uh, Yahya Hindi, along with uh, who are being joined by President Pollard in civil discourse. I'm going to introduce each one in turn. As a child of Indian immigrants, Mr. Neil Saxena understands the cultural and linguistic difference that many Asian immigrants experience and is a vociferous advocate for education. As the executive director at Asian American LEAD, his work supports low-income and underserved Asian Pacific American youth, helping them to construct educational goals, learn about their own and others' cultures, and take on leadership roles in the community. In Saxena's experience, engaging across cultural differences can be empowering and transforming for people on both sides of the conversation. Reaching across differences to make education accessible to all in his personal and professional mission. Mr. Saxena applies his over 15 years of experience in nonprofits and local government working with the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Neil took over as executive director in November 2016 after serving as the development and communications director at AA LEAD. Neil has a proven track record of direct service and advocacy work. 
He is committed to working with overlooked populations such as the low income and underserved youth at AA Lead. He has been connected to AA Lead since serving as a mentor in 2000. Previously, Neil served at the grant manager in the District of Columbia's Mayor's Office on Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs. He, dis he distributed over $1.25 million in direct service and capacity building grants and developed the agency's language access and grant. His language access work was nationally recognized by the Migration Policy Institute for his efforts on translation quality control. In 2014, Neil received the Outstanding Service Award from the US Census Bureau, and in 2012, a Partnership Recognition Award for his work in the district on the 2010 census. He was appointed in 2006 as the US Consensus Advisory Committee on Race and Ethnic Communities and reappointed in 2009. In 2012, Neil was appointed to the United States Census Bureau National Advisory Committee under the Obama administration. Neil was an active member of Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders in, philanthrop in philanthropy, served as a co-chair for the Asian American community in 2020 Census Working Group, and chaired the DC Public Schools Joint Advisory Council. Neil has a master's in public policy from American University School of Public Affairs and a BA in economics from the University of Maryland College Park. And now it's my honor again to introduce Imam uh, Hindi. Imam Yahya Hindi is the first Muslim chaplain at Georgetown University, the first American university to hire a full-time Muslim chaplain. And he has just concluded his 15 years of service as the chaplain at the National Naval Me Medical S Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Imam Hindi teaches across different every day. As a chaplain at Georgetown University, a Catholic university, part of his job description is to lead explorations about religious traditions and their role that they play in multicultural societies like ours. Imam Himdi is a public policy, conflict resolution fellow at the Center of Dispute Resolution of the University of Maryland School of Law and the Maryland Judiciary Medita Mediation and Conflict Resolution Office. He's also the founder and the president of Clergy Beyond Borders. Remember, Clergy Beyond Borders. We have engineers without borders, <laughs> but here we have got clergy beyond borders. He also serves as a member of the Islamic Jurisprudence Council of North America, and that's where I had first met uh, Imam Hindi during the Sharia conference many years back. He has served as an adjunct faculty member for the Krieger School of Arts and Science and Osher's Lifelong Learning Institute of John Hopkins University, Fordham University, and Hartford Seminary. Imam Hindi also teaches a very popular course at Georgetown University called Inter-Religious Encounter. Sounds like a very interesting course. Imam Hindi's undergraduate education was in Islamic studies, and his graduate education was in comparative religions with interest in Christianity, Judaism, comparative religions, and inter-religious dialogue and relations. He has written numerous publications on many topics, including women in Islam, women and gender relations in Islam, the, sec the second coming of the Messiah, Islam and biomedical ethics, and religion and Islam in the United States. A sought-after speaker, Imam Hindi has presented a multitude, a multitude of interfaith and general lectures in the USA, Asia, 
Africa, Europe, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, Australia, and the Middle East in the past 14 years. And he has been to more than 41 countries and 45 United States for conferences and speeches. Mr. Hindi was one of the Muslim leaders who met with President Clinton, as well as President Bush, as well as President Obama. Imam Hindi often visits and lectures at churches and synagogues, hoping to create a new positive relationship between the followers of the three Abrahamic religions. In his lectures, Imam Hindi focuses on issues related to gender relations, domestic violence, world peace, economic and political justice, and interreligious and interfaith issues. Imam Hindi appeared on many national and international television and radio shows as an expert on interfaith dialogue and on Islam and Muslims. For example, CNN, ABC, Fox, Kuwait TV, uh, Pakistan Channel, RAI, MSNB, and Al Jazeera. Imam Hindi recently engaged nationally and internationally on raising awareness on issues of the 21st century, which included environmental responsibility, a peaceful resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict, eliminating poverty, fighting against the growing sense of militarianism, and empowering Muslims to reform the way they practice and understand Islam. Imam Hindi believes that with love and education, the world will be a better place to live in. I present it to you President Bolad, Mr. Saxena, and Imam Hindi. Thank you so much, Dr. Durrani. And if I am to do this correctly, uh, my <laughs> intent is for us to have dialogue uh, probably until about 8 o'clock, a little bit before, and then open it up to the audience for questions that you may pose to uh, our guests, there are two microphones that are in the aisles. We'll ask you to use those microphones as the show is being recorded uh, for future television uh, usage. With that, let me start off with a question that um, I find to be at the root of so many things. And I'll start with you, um, Iman Hindi. I've read some of your comments where you've made uh, very, I think, insightful uh, observations about what causes uh, challenges or the chasm between people who practice different religions, and you said is really because of the quote lack of listening, and that resonated deeply with me. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. Well, uh, before I say anything, I want to thank you. Oh, you're welcome. The college, all of you, for being here. It's it, it's really my honor. Mm. Well, I don't know if you want to give a microphone to a clergy. <laughs> I always say I am an imam trained to preach by a Baptist minister. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> from Alabama. I know. I can tell. <laughs> so I don't know if I can really speak with two minutes or one minute. You know, but before I answer the question, I heard the term minority and majority. Recently, I became more sensitive to these terms. Why do we even have to use the terms? Why do we have to create the culture to see you as minority or as majority. Mm -hmm. Cannot we get rid of these labels <laughs> that have separated us from one another? And I think that is one of the problems in the world now. Politics use labels for its own agendas and always bad agendas. Mm -hmm. And so much has been used using these terms to divide people from one another. And we have to relook and redefine these terms. That's number one. Number two, I heard the word civility. Mm -hmm. I have been thinking about this term civilized. We are a civilized nation. And the other is not as civilized. Always when we talk about civilized or civilization, we mean we have high-rise buildings, we have good highways and materialistic services. But I think the word civilized and civility 
are interconnected. Mm. A nation cannot be civilized only because of high-rise buildings, but also because of the level of civility that shapes that nation. It is not the money, it's not how you look, it is rather how you communicate and intercommunicate across differences and with one another, with civility, that makes a nation civilized. Mm. And I say this because I have been, and I, in my own way, I looked at countries where there have been so much civility in the intercommunication between its members. Even in our way of perceived and defining civilization, we are not civilized. So can we reuse that term and reproduce it in the context in which we live? To, to answer or the word beyond is connected to this. It was debated for almost three years, should we call the organization clergy without borders hmm. or beyond borders? And I, I insisted that it would be called beyond borders because I acknowledge the existence of borders between religions, not as something that divides us, but rather something that we can celebrate and it can bring us together. So it's great to have Jews and Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and Baha'is and Sikh and Native Indians and Protestant and Catholic and all of us. And then that's what makes the nation great and that's what makes us all great. And, and so how can we celebrate the borders, not give, get rid of borders? I want you to come to the table proud of who you are, whatever the identity you come with. And I want you to be proud of it, speak about it with honor and dignity and no shame, but give me the ability to come to the table with the same intensity, with the same passion, with the same interest in the identity I have. And let's find ways to celebrate that, that, that uh, 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 diversity. Because I really believe that in diversity lies not only our unity, but also our strength and our power. Mm. To the idea of listening, they say for the first week after marriage, the man talks and the woman listens for the second week, she talks and he listens, for the third week, both of them talk and only the neighbors listen. <laughs> so this lack of listening, but also lack of hearing. Mm -hmm. I may listen to you, but not hear you. I may hear your words. I may listen to your words, but not understand where you are coming from. And lack of listening to one another is for me what led to so much conflicts in the world my lack of interest in your message the way you see it, mm -hmm. or my lack of putting my lens aside and instead using your lens to understand you has led to so many problems. And therefore, when I talk about lack of listening as a problem, but the mastering of, of master or the master of the art of listening as a solution is how can we put each other in, in, in our, in, you know, in, like how, how do I understand myself the other, as the other wants me to, be, to, to, to understand him? How do you understand Islam from within, not from without? How do I understand Islam not using Fox News lens or Al Jazeera lens, but rather the way Islam wants to be perceived? You know, when I went to a Christian seminary for my master's education, intentionally, I said, you Christians teach me what you think Christianity is. I don't want my Muslim fellows to teach me Christianity. For the same reason I, when I went for my PhD work and I studied Judaism, that you Jews teach me how you think of yourselves. Hmm. I don't want to see you in the way I see you. And maybe that's what led to my interfaith work and interreligious relations, my, my desire of using someone else's lens to understand them, 
uh, my desire to be humble in that dialogue, because it's not about me, it's really about you, and humility as, as a, a virtue can, that can lead to, 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 to success. Um, I'll, so, I'll stop here for right now and yeah, see. Yeah, Because I want to build on that because I think it's interesting. Uh, I have a, a degree in religious studies, so I find myself wanting to do a couple of things is to have this uh, theological conversation with you. I think it would be so uh, uplifting for my spirit to have we that. Can do, we can do I that. I'm sure. Here, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if everybody else would be a part of that. But what I do think is important, if I could bring in Neil in, in this idea, one of the things that Iman talked about was how to celebrate borders. And right now, um, I shared with uh, some folks earlier, the reason we're having this dialogue is actually based on something you said to me in a meeting. And you talked about uh, before the inauguration, uh, the impact of this recent election and what it was having on uh, communities uh, that you serve and communities that you're aware of. And, and I'm, I'm um, deeply moved by this idea of celebrating borders in a period of time where it appears that we're not necessarily celebrating that. So we know that a third of the people in Montgomery County were born in another country. Um, what have been some of your reactions to this environment that you're seeing both locally and perhaps even nationally? Because this idea of having interaction and intercommunications to have civilized discourse and to celebrate borders almost seems to be antithetical to this moment that we're living in right now. So I actually wanted to uh, thank you all, and I wanted to touch actually based on uh, a little bit about the lack of listening, because mm -hmm. this really goes to our youth. And, and one of the things that, uh, for me growing up and experiencing 9-11 is, I didn't know how to listen. No one told me how to listen. We teach our youth, you just have to listen to us, we don't listen to them. Uh, we don't engage them. We don't make them part of this conversation. And, and I think it's a great point you talk about lack, lack of listening, and right after 9-11, when I faced challenges, my first reaction was anger, was violence. If someone's coming violent to me, I would become violent with them. Um, and, and so it wasn't until I really gained compassion, learned how to be compassionate about where, where, what is the context of these individuals? Where are they coming from? Um, why are they so angry with me going to the grocery store? Why are they so angry with me going to, I guess I don't have Blockbuster anymore, but renting a movie. Um, and so I, I had to, to really learn how to listen and, and understand where they're coming from. Um, in our work, uh, what we want to do is, is really listen to our youth. Um, there's a common saying out there, we have to give youth voice. Um, a lot of our staff talk about our youth have voice. We just have to listen to their voice. Um, and going back to, uh, to your question about what we're experiencing, I, th I think this, this really comes down to I've seen around class. Uh, I think many of our low-income Asian Americans um, have different experiences than maybe our wealthier Asian Americans. Um, I've heard comments from some of our wealthier Asian Americans that, you know, after eight years of Obama, they didn't really think race was an issue anymore. Um, they're living in, I think there's this common term about this bubble. Um, that was the bubble. They're working in spaces or working in areas where they may not encounter overt racism. They, they are encountering systemic racism. They're encountering microaggressions. Um, whereas our low-income individuals will, fa will be facing, you know, when they go to the grocery store, they'll get that comment. They're not in those spaces. Um, and so it really comes down, comes down to class for me. Um, af after this election, uh, you know, I had a conversation with my family and, and we, we talked about, well, you know, what will happen to uh, our youth had come and said they, they felt fear, they felt stressed. They didn't know what was gonna happen, the uncertainty uh, of it. Um, in, in Montgomery County, there started to become increase, increasing number of hate crimes. What do I do if I'm a, a victim of a hate crime? Who do I go to, who do I talk to? Do my parents have the tools to be able to support me? Um, does the school have the tools to, to be able to support me? Um, and so the, the, the great unknown, um, and then they're, they're youth, they're young people. You know, so they have their other challenges of, you know, what do I post on Facebook? What do I post on Instagram? You know, how does my life look like? Um, those are the things that we want them to think about. And, and now they have this additional burden of, um, how, how do I manage this additional stress? I have finals coming up and someone made this comment. What do I do? Um, and, and I think one of the, the, the other pieces is, um, you know, at looking at just the history of our country, this is not new. This is not new for us. 
um, which is the unfortunate piece. Um, I pulled up some, some old acts um, that we've, we've, we've gone through this before. Um, in 1870, we had the Anti-Naturalization Act. Uh, basically, Asian Americans could not become naturalized. Uh, one of the first cases that came um, was that uh, Asian, Americans can, Asian Americans cannot testify against white Americans for a crime, hmm. um, just because they were different. Um, 1882, we had the Chinese Ex Exclusion Act. Um, they excluded just one group of individuals um, because of, of where they came from, um, what they believed in. Uh, 1907, the Asian, Asian Exclusion Act barred Indians because there were too many Indians coming into the country. I don't know what too many Indians were hmm. in 1907. I feel like there's a lot of land um, that they could have covered. Uh, and 1917, there was the Anti-Immigration Act um, that barred individuals from Asiatic zones. Um, and then, and, and I think now what's being referenced a lot is the 1942 uh, Japanese internment. Um, and so these are things that have been happening in our country, yet we haven't learned. And I think a big part of it is we haven't brought these up into the dialogue and the conversation and understand why we did this. Um, all of these different acts are not in our history books. So we're not learning from these. We're not talking about these. Um, and our youth are not learning about these. And we're having to bring these up in our after school conversations. And they don't have opportunities to talk about this in school. Um, so when we talk about dialogue, I think it's really encountering and engaging our youth um, to help them find where are the supports that they can go to? Who are the trusted members in the community? Who can they really rely on? And, say, OK, well, I have this issue. Um, you know, I want to have a conversation with you. Um, and I think that the final thing I want to say is, how do we have those conversations with people who have differing views? What are those forms? I think that's something that where I'm struggling to find uh, spaces to, to have a dialogue and a conversation with others. Um, I have many conversations with people who think like me. Um, and so how do we, how do we get, bring, broaden that conversation? I think would be something great. Um, to hear, I know how to listen now. Um, and so to be able to listen to those individuals, I think, would be very powerful. So interesting. This idea of listening suggests there's a, a dialogic relationship, that you are both a hearer and a speaker, that you have uh, an equal and weighted, and that's actually, I think, probably more. Listening is harder than it is speaking, because you actually have to listen without having a direct response if you're doing true listening. And to hear someone in that exchange is very powerful. I, I've started, um, one way for myself to do this is, is having these dinner parties where I'm trying to invite people into my home once or twice, uh, once every other month, and it's people who may not typically be together, and to talk about issues and to uh, figure out um, opportunities to share in very thoughtful ways. And that, that is, in that framework, kind of takes into this next question, because both of you have, have played off of this. Um, in particular, I start with you, Iman. Um, I would imagine uh, that you find yourself having to debunk a lot of inaccuracies about religion in your work. Um, I think you probably spend a good amount of time helping to listen and hear what, uh, what the real question is, and also sometimes helping to give answers to questions that aren't articulated but are somehow implied. So here's one. What do you think is the most important thing people understand about Islam? What do you think they should know in the US? And what misconception do you find to be? I know, just one, most common or damaging. You can give me two if you need to. Because I know how you preachers go. You just roll it all in there together. Well, to start with, maybe I'll say you have a booklet free. Mm -hmm. It's in the back. And in it, there are frequently asked questions about Islam, oh. Christianity, and Judaism. And it was prepared in a manner or in a way where we engage the three communities. And hopefully we'll expand it to Hinduism and Buddhism and other faith communities. So this will help. Somebody hold me one. <laughs> <laughs> also, I, to answer that question, because it's almost impossible to answer it in one minute or half an hour, I also produced um, a series of CDs in the back. You can please buy them for $10 for eight of them. You know, I have to do some marketing, sorry. <laughs> but uh, uh, I would say maybe jihad. Mm -hmm. Jihad, jihadism, jihadists. Mm -hmm. 
And I would like every American non-Muslim to know, every citizen of the world to know, that jihad does not mean holy war. Actually, the concept of holy war, harb muqaddasa, does not appear in the Quran. Mm. And I said this with Peter Jennings on September 11, 2001 on ABC. I said, I'll give $10 million to anyone who shows me the term holy war in the Quran. I don't worry, I don't have $10 million, <laughs> but no one will ever find it, so it's not an issue. Jihad means to strive to do good. So, in your attempt to strive to do good on Saturday, taking care of your mother is jihad. Taking your father to a clinic is jihad. Uh, 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 work, taking care of your cat is jihad. Uh, 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 working hard to feed your kids is jihad. Hmm. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked is jihad. So Matthew 25, 31 to 46, who are Christians amongst you, know exactly what I'm talking about, the concept of social justice. That's all jihad. Jihad is to strive to do good. Mm. So committing yourself to the common good of our people is jihad. And nothing hurts me as an, a Muslim educator more than calling terrorists jihadists. Mm. The terrorists are terrorists. And terrorism is not or does not have religion. And therefore, Islamic terrorism or Christian terrorism or Hindu terrorism should not exist in our dictionaries. Terrorism is an act of terrorism and terror carried out by individuals, whether you, they happen to be Christians or Jewish or Muslim. I want people to know that jihad is something that is good, exists in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in the Christianity, in Judaism, in humanism. Every act of God is, is jihad. Something else, maybe women. People think that uh, women are second-class citizens in Islam. I say, guess what? Number one, in 839, a university called Qarawiyin was founded in Fas, Morocco, 839, by a woman who became the president of that university in 839 when Europe was wondering about the very nature of women, mm. not only in, in theology, but also in science and public life. Al-Azhar University of Egypt, that continues to exist, by the way, was founded in 1069 by a woman, 1,000 years ago. The Quran does not have a word for wife and a word for husband. There's one word for both. Zawj, which means equal partner. Hmm. So when I do marriage ceremonies, I remind the couple that you are equal partners signing up on zawaj, on partnership, in which both of you are equal in every way, shape, and, and, and form. The Quran care says word by word, al-mu'minuna wal-mu'minat, believing men and women are the protectors of one another. They both enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil. So women are, I, mean, I wish I, I mean, this is like, I, I have a CD about it, I publish about it. Women in Islam have the position that no one could ever imagine. So I want non-Muslims to know that we honor our women too. 59% mm -hmm. uh, uh, of college students in the Muslim world are females, 59%. 61% of Muslim students in American colleges, 61% are female Muslims. So there are more female Muslims going to colleges in America than male Muslims. Or the idea that Islam hates Jews and Christians and wants us to kill Jews and Christians. Again, I wish there was time, and I know I'm being very simplistic, only because we don't have time. Islam calls Jews and Christians Ahlul Kitab. The word Ahl means family. So Jews and Christians, according to Islam, are members of the one family. Mm. The one family that believes in God, in monotheism. 
Islam is a pluralistic religion by Quranic basis. The Quran says, if God had wanted, God would have made you all the same. So God wants us to be different according to Islam. And in chapter 49, 13, it says that you may come to know one another. Mm -hmm. In chapter 30, it says, if you want to know how wonderful, how great, majestic God is, look into the diversity of your tongues and the colors of your skin. Mm. That's how good God is. Mm. So the diversity of your colors and languages is one of the greatest proofs of God according to Islam. So I look at the diversity of this beautiful room and say, subhanallah, the Arabic for hallelujah. Glory be to God. This is beautiful. That's God in, 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 in this room. Uh, this is what I would want people to know about Islam. Islam is not this crazy, strange religion whose followers are out there to convert Americans and force them to Islam. And No, we're here because we want to be a part of this American dream in which we all live side by side with our differences and with our uh, pluralism. I think I, um, was one, that is one of the most powerful and succinct uh, reflections upon this, in particular this idea of celebrating diversity, to recognize that there is a mutuality uh, to our existence, that I value you for who you are, and I also hope that you would value me for who I am. That's a, a powerful concept. And I think if we translate that also to Neil, one of the things that I heard you say in your conversation earlier comment was to talk about class and the diversity of this concept of Asian Americans. And oftentimes we use these umbrella terms, jihad, radical Islamic terrorism, and we put this umbrella over things. And we do the same thing about racial identity. We have Asian Americans, and we think about as this one monolith of this is this group of people. And I've heard you talk quite a bit about this idea that there are differences within this religious, national, immigration status, class, education. Could you talk a little bit about that diversity, but then also some of you can, the commonalities that might be of use for this conversation as well? So I think Asian American is an interesting term. I wasn't Asian American until I got to college. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what it meant. I was Indian American uh, at home. My parents were Indian American, and while well, I was Indian at home and then American at school, and I yeah. then became Indian American. Uh, but the, the whole Asian American concept really came in the 60s. Uh, that's when the term was coined. Um, the census didn't recognize Asian American until the 80s. Uh, Indi Indian Americans were, were classified as white until 1977. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these are all social constructs. And so for our community, it's what is Asian American? Who are we? Uh, a lot of our youth will come in, and when we do recruiting, they may not, not even know that they are looked upon as Asian American. Mm. Uh, and so that's where the first difference starts, is they identify themselves as Chinese American, Indonesian American, Nepalese American, uh, maybe not even American at that point. Uh, and so for us, it's about educating them about how do people view them? Uh, that's really where these labels come into play. It's how are they viewed when they go out there. Uh, the way I look, uh, someone may consider me Arab, someone may consider mm -hmm. me Jewish, someone may consider me Indian American. I've gotten all of those. Uh, and so people are classifying um, people by that. And so they look at East, East Asians and they say, okay, well, they're Asian. They look at South Asians, they're like, well, I don't know if they're really Asian. We, the, what we've seen out there are, are East Asians. Um, Actually, before the 1960s, um, Arabs and Jew Jewish people were considered uh, Asian American. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until the 70s and 80s where um, they moved those populations away. Let me emphasize that. Many people don't know that you may be Indian, but Jewish Indian. Right. Or a Christian Indian, or Muslim, or Hindu Indian. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that difference is even greater. So I can tell you, I am a, uh, my mom is from Bangladesh, and my dad's from, from India. Uh, and I was born in India, and so I, you know, I came here, and I was like, I'll be Indian American. Uh, my wife is, is uh, also Indian American, but she's from South India. Mm -hmm. We don't speak the same language. We don't eat the same food. Uh, we have different religions. 
Um, and so just because we're both Indian, we, put we have a label on you. So right. You're all, oh, wow. Right. And we have nothing in common. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're let's Indian. hope that's not true. <laughs> Opposites attract. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think th that's, that's really where the differences are. Um, and, 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 and now we're seeing, um, you know, the really socioeconomic status for, for Asian Americans. Uh, there's been a narrative written about who is Asian American. Um, for the last 30, 40 years, that narrative started off, um, one of the first articles came out uh, in the 80s um, called Whiz Kids. Uh, Time Magazine had this whole thing, it was called Whiz Kids. It had a bunch of Asian American youth on there um, saying these are the next generation, these are the individuals, uh, and that's slowly, slow, and slowly and slowly filtered down into the education system, filtered down into social services, filtered down into government, uh, that Asian Americans are successful, we have this, um, during the, the 19th. The model minority. The model minority. Yes. Um, and that really came from, from some of the immigration pac practices in the 1960s, um, where the United States was looking for highly technical individuals. Um, they called the brain drain, and a lot of these uh, individuals came over. They were very successful, uh, and they interacted with, you know, African Americans, white Americans, Latinos, and that's who they saw. Uh, but now, you know, we've moved 30, 40 years, there are other Asian Americans who are coming in who don't have that skill set. Uh, and so I think that's really the, the biggest difference that, that we see is their experience is, is vastly different than those who came during different uh, migration times. Um, and in terms of similarities, I would say there, you know, there are many similarities, but I think the one similarity that links us all is how we're viewed, how Asian Americans are viewed. Um, when, when um, they have a, a teacher as a classroom, they'll see Asian Americans in the classroom, they're not looking at the individual, they're looking at the group. Uh, and that's, that's the challenge. And I think this is the same challenge um, that you talked a little bit about, is they have their perspective of, of who is Muslim, this is my thing. Um, so all of you are, are this. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, you're from Egypt or you're from Pakistan or you're from uh, another country in, in Africa, or you're from uh, the Middle East. Um, you're, you're Muslim and this is it. You're Asian American and you have these four things, characteristics. Um, and so how we're viewed is, is really what, um, is really, I think, the, the common bond um, that we see. But in our programs, what we try and do is <clears throat> that you're a part of this Asian American umbra umbrella that someone has set, set for you that you belong to. Um, and so, you know, what are some of the similarities? And so we talk, we have them um, talk to each other about, so I celebrate Eid, but what does that mean to the others, other folks there? Um, what, I celebrate Chinese New Year, um, what does that mean? And then finding common, like, common similarities between that. Many of our Asian American groups have fall festivals um, that celebrate the harvest. Um, those similarities across the board, and so they, we try and find those similarities to really build them up to find that common Asian American identity. We just went out to, um, as a team, went out to eat. And I was like, well, what is Asian American food? Like, we should have a food, an Asian American food. We have Asian food, um, but we don't have like an Asian American food. Uh, and identity is really linked to how I believe and I love food. And so I always try to link identity to food, um, but we don't have that. I think because this is a new identity that people are still getting used to defining what that is. I also would imagine it's because we have, we've put uh, we, we spoke, we speak of Asian American as, as if it's a homogenous group where there are multiple uh, ethnic uh, groups within the Asian category, and, but we don't speak to that. So therefore we say, this is this group of folks and this is how they all look, this is how they sound, these are their common experiences, their lived experiences. Same as we do oftentimes for, this is a Muslim in America, and this is what their lived experience is, this is what they believe, this is their language. And there's, a, there's an interesting commonality in both of your responses thus far about how others see us one way or the other. I could offer the same thing uh, from my racial background, how people see you and that perception and how that interacts. So how do you begin to talk about this or think about this personally? I think one of the questions I, I posed and I thought about this um, Iman Hindi is that you are a scholar and you're an interfaith leader. Uh, you would be a, a great person to have at a dinner table to talk about any number of these different issues. But you're also a Muslim living in the United States, raising a family with a beautiful wife who came with you today. Uh, what do you tell your children 
about people who commit violence in the name of Islam without giving um, a clear rationale for their work that they're doing, their actions. They just say, this is who I am, and this is the story, and therefore they use terminology and phrases that are too simplistic, that are wrong, and that paint a broad stroke over people, a whole group of people. You know, actually, you make me think of, um, of our son, Zachariah, who was asked, he's 14, uh, in social studies to write a paper uh, on whatever. And he chose to write about Islam, Islamic history and warfare. Mm. And he ended up being praised for it, and now the principal is happy, and everyone's talking about the paper. And he decided to go through 1,400 years of history and how Islam, as a religion, formed how Muslims engaged in warfare and the ethics of warfare in Islamic jurisprudence. And his teacher told him, I never thought that Islam has a full theory against terrorism and how Islam embodied laws and regulations of what you do and don't do in war and how Islam, what Islam did in the first century, second century. And um, so for my son, he decided to do that paper because on daily basis he hears it on TV and radio, mm -hmm. Muslims are terrorists, Muslims are terrorists, Muslims are violent, Muslims are violent. He wanted to find for himself. And he came to me, I said, I can provide you for the books, but you have to do the research yourself. And now he's more committed to making, as he said, every non-Muslim American see that Islam is a peaceful religion in theory and in practice historically, mm. even when we acknowledge that we have our own bad, rotten apples in the box. Mm -hmm. And I told him he needed to make sure that is in his paper, that yes, Muslims are human beings, and yes, Muslims may violate the tenets of their faith and the ethics and the values of their religion. And the problem is not because of Islam, but rather despite of Islam. Mm. So with my, our kids, we talk about the Quran. We do Quran study. We do history. We navigate it through these very tough issues uh, of, of why Muslims fail and how Muslims fail and what it means for him and her to change the course of action. So I'll, I'll give the audience, if I look at this time, as I, I think I may have planned it just right without intentionally doing that, uh, to invite you to post questions. Now I have a whole bunch more here and I can always go to them, uh, but I want to give you an opportunity and there are two microphones and you have these wonderful men who could offer their perspective and feedback. And after the first one, it gets real easy. <laughs> Gotta be some one brave soul to go to the microphone. And don't be shy, my friend. Go to the, pod, to the microphone and ask. I want to know what Sharia law is. There seems to be a lot of misconception here in the U.S. People are scared about Sharia law. What actually is Sharia law? Do you have an hour? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, and I know it might, again, sound simplistic or apologetic, and it's not. Sharia law, such a term, is not an authentic term. The Arabic word for law is hukuk or qanun. Number one. Number two, Sharia means path. Shara, a road. Very much like in Judaism, Jewish law is called halakha, the Hebrew word for path, for road. So is Muslim references to ethics and values. Sharia is not law, the way we understand law in the United States of America. Sharia is ethical paradigms and values of how we ought to think as Muslims. 
again, I wish there was time, we start with talking about what we call the five objectives of Sharia. For anything to be Sharia binding, it has to meet one, at least one of five objectives of Sharia. But any of the five objectives start with the word safeguard. So number one, to safeguard people's right to religion. That's Sharia. And not only Islam, your right to practice any religion you want. I might really shock you. Islam in the Quran may even consider atheism as a religion. kafirun at the end, lakum dinukum waliyadin. All you who don't believe in God, to you is your religion and to me is mine. So Islamic Sharia acknowledges atheism as a faith, meaning as a way of life that has to be honored and respected. Number two, to safeguard the intellect and people's right to knowledge. Number three, to safeguard people's right to accumulate wealth and make money. Number four, to safeguard your right to procreate and your right to choose to procreate or not procreate. Marriage in Islam is not meant for a procreation. However, procreation is a possible consequence of, mar of marriage. Number four, the last one is to safeguard your dignity and your honor as a human being. This is Sharia. Some people refer to Sharia by talking about something else. Our spiritual system is also called Sharia. So my five daily prayers is called Sharia. My fasting Ramadan is Sharia. Uh, the, the way by which I interact with my fellow neighbors is Sharia. Sh some, sh some Sharia is static and it does not change. And some Sharia is by default changes and evolves with time. So Sharia is not what people think Sharia is. The last thing I would say, Sharia values and paradigms are meant by Muslims for Muslims. Mm. What does this mean? By definition of Sharia, they are not forcible on non-Muslims. So when they tell you on, t on TV that we're here to force Sharia on non-Muslims, what? Sharia by default is only for Muslims by Muslims. Non-Muslims may choose to fall into Sharia. So if you want to, for example, uh, Muslim don't drink alcohol. It's your right as non-Muslim not to drink alcohol and fall into that paradigm and value. But it's you. So Sharia is not what people think. A part of Sharia is biomedical ethics. So what do I do at the end of life? Do I unplug or keep it go going? It's Sharia. In that regard, it's not static. It changes, and it's a personal preference sometimes and in terms of how you understand life and death and, and what constitutes life and death. That's what Sharia is. Sharia is social justice. Well, I can conclude by this. Sharia, I tried and I published an article on this. I say Sharia is built on three big paradigms. Politics of justice, economics of equity, and covenant of community. That's Sharia. Politics of justice, any governance, whether in the house, or in an institution, or in a government, has to be run by justice. Where everyone has equal say, say in what happens. Uh, economics of equity, that people have equal access to wealth, equal access to growing that wealth, equal access to education to help them grow that wealth, and covenant of community, that we are all fellow equal partners as human beings in the making of our humanity. That's Sharia too. I don't know what is frightening in these concepts other than ignorance of what Islam really is. You know what I find provocative about that too is the <clears throat> inability to translate what you're, what, how you've described this um, misinterpretation, co-optation, in some cases mutilation of 
fundamental core belief systems of a religious um, group and now our inability to translate that being done within other religious groups. I grew up as a, in the black Baptist church. Uh, we have seen Christianity used to justify any number of different things in this country. Slavery, objectification of women. I mean, we could go down the list of things that we've seen. Christianity and other, I'm sure every religion has some way in which it has been used to justify some end and not have the ability to critically think about what that is actually, what, what's happening. Instead, we buy into the talking heads on the television or the folks who use that in their way and say, this is what this means, without actually doing the work to understand what that means within a, a faith tradition. You fear that which you do not know. Yes. Always. You fear that which you do not know. People fear Islam <laughs> because they don't know Islam. People who fear Judaism because they don't know Judaism. You know, Hinduism, how, how, how much of America understands Hinduism? Very little. And if they were to study Hinduism, they would be surprised of what Hinduism has to offer the world. And I say this and I mean it word by word, mm -hmm. but it's fear of the unknown. Fear of the otherness. Yeah. And I think I wanted to uh, just jump in real quick is, is this needs to start early on with our young people. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is what we're missing. We're having conversations as adults, we're able to process these, but these ideas about Asian Americans or Muslim Americans are not in our textbooks, are not a part of our curriculum. And for us to be able to really just sw switch off and say, okay, well, I, I've, I've heard about Muslim Americans in one line of a, of a history book. Uh, I've heard about Indian Americans and India has a Taj Mahal, that's all I know, and so I have four points of reference for everything. Uh, but, but we don't have this, this idea of um, digging deeper and learning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it's trying to find that balance as, as we move into this, this new age of bite-sized information which dictates our philosophy, that dictates our actions. Uh, how do we take that right information and put it in there. And it really goes, for me, it goes back to education. Uh, and, and really starting at the elementary school level, we get so nervous and scared. Is this appropriate for elementary school kids? Is this appropriate for, to, to, to teach them this? There are ways to, that we can introduce this. Uh, there's so many new children's books that talk about these things. Uh, they talk about the right things. And, and as adults, we, we start to form our, our opinions. And, and, uh, and honestly, they're, they're hard to change. We, changing our habits and, and changing those things um, takes a long time. And, and, and so that's why, you know, we, when we run our elementary school program, that's where we want, really want to start, is talking about being proud of, of how you are at that level. Um, and I think the same thing applies, is, is, is working with college students could take them a whole semester to change their mind. But elementary school, if you, if you get them in and say, oh, you know, I remember there was something they talked about this. Um, you know, this might not be right. Or they see something on TV and they're like, well, this is not what, what my teacher taught me. Maybe let me go look up a little bit more information, look up three or four sources of information to find the right answer. Um, so I really think it goes back to this education. We've, we've really moved away from, from digging deeper into, into all of these topics um, and just hit the surface on a lot of those. I, I think that suggests a vulnerability that most of us are uncomfortable with. Uh, I've, I've told this story, uh, and it still pains me uh, to this day because I need to figure out how to fix this in a more thoughtful way. Uh, but my then kindergartner came home and said, Mama, uh, I want us to celebrate Diwali. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, well, what is Diwali, sweetheart? Uh, he's in Montgomery County. It's the most, one of the most diverse school systems in the country. And he says, ah, it's a holiday of goodness and light, Mama, and we should celebrate this. I said, okay, sweetheart. Well, I've been to India a couple of times. I said, I, can, I was there one time for Diwali. I can talk to you about this. And I was prepared, and our neighbors next door are Indian. And I said, um, we were walking in, and Miles was telling me this whole story, and he says he was going to become a vegetarian because his friend Arun is vegetarian. But could I also make him some chicken nuggets? And, <laughs> <laughs> and I, we had to explain, these are veggie nuggets. You're OK. <laughs> um, but then he said, and I, so I turned to my neighbor, and I says, Miles, um, has come home from school and he wants to have a Diwali Day celebration. Would you all like to come over and we'll figure out what this is? And I remember the, the neighbor, he says, he says, well, uh, we're Muslim. And I remember pausing and I said, 
okay, and, and there was an awkwardness in that conversation because at that point, neither one of us knew what to do from that space. And there's been this kind of artificial friendliness, hey, how you doing, since then, but not this recognition and honoring that something happened there. I made an assumption about you, and I also I thought that I was doing it, because really, to be honest, you know, I was showing you how hip I was. You know, I knew what Diwali Day was. I've been to India a couple of times. Let me, let me, and, and really to kind of have to check myself and that vulnerability that comes now, how do I re-extend this, rela or rekindle this relationship because there is an awkwardness there to it. And there is a vulnerability that we all have to be willing to do to understand when you hear certain terms to ask what that means. Children... Don't, they don't have that. I mean, they, 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 they're, they're vulnerable every day of their life, and they're prepared to do that. As we get older, we build up these safeguards to protect ourselves, and we build assumptions about other people without having the willingness to oftentimes sit down and ask that question. So if we can cultivate that in children at an earlier age, there perhaps is some hope for us after all. Other questions or comments from the audience? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is to Neil. What you brought up was a very good point. Teach them earlier. I had three kids in elementary school, so I did the Ramadan thing. I would go and teach the classes where Ramadan is about, what Islam is at, after 9-11. So teachers were really good, and they were really cooperating about it. But all of a sudden, Montgomery County decided they wanted to keep religion outside of the school. So now when the parents want to do these things, they cannot be taught. So how do we not be able to do that? So we have to get our educational, educational people on board to say this is very important to have diversity in the school and be able to, and that age, they do understand. And the teachers were very helpful about it and they would really love those dates and we would have clothes for them, they would try them out. So it wasn't unusual for them to go and see a Muslim friend of theirs, they would be wearing those clothes and they'd be really open about it. So is there any idea you have? You can do something that can open up the school system? I, I think it comes back to the youth. Uh, you know, when we do these different celebrations, it's the youth who are leading them. The youth are talking about Diwali. The youth are talking about, um, you know, Chinese New Year. And they're talking to their peers. I think there's so much more power. Uh, and when I go talk to my kids, they don't listen to me. But if another kid is doing something, they're like, oh, I'll do that. He's, you know, he's doing it. And I was like, well, I just told you that the day before. Um, and so I think it, it also helps the young people feel proud of who they are because they're able to share something about what they do outside of the school space, right? And so I remember growing up, uh, I was very pr proud to be Indian, uh, but I never shared that at school. Uh, someone, would, would, the India unit would come up, I'd always put my head down not wanted to be called on. Obviously, I was the Indian expert at six years old. Um, <laughs> and so everyone would look at me and like, is that, is that true? Um, <laughs> right. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's really having uh, the youth in, in the school system, you know, be able to go and talk to the teacher, talk to the principal, uh, and really get them um, to be the voice of, of, of moving things forward. Um, and connecting with other youth there. Because um, I think there, there's so much power, and I already said this, is that in, in the youth engaging other youth. Um, and as adults, you know, the, the principals, and I'm sure for Dr. Pollard, if a youth come, many youth come to her and, and say this is an issue, she's gonna take a lot more seriously than maybe an adult comes and, and tells her it's an issue. Because um, at the end of the day, that's, that's who we're working with um, and working for. Um, so that I would suggest to you is that is, is really, you know, talking with, with your young people and seeing are there other, people, other classmates who feel the same way um, and maybe sending a letter to the principal or sending a letter to their, um, to their classmates and then also getting involved in, in, in Montgomery County Council hearings. Um, you know, I think some, sometimes writing letters or, you know, if they host a hearing during the daytime, say, you know, I want my young person to come, host it at 8 o'clock, this is what works for me. Um, I think sometimes we, we forget that as residents and as young people, we're the ones with the power. Um, we get intimidated by all of these um, Congress people and all of that, but, 
but we're the ones who are able to say. They, ha they have to watch what they're saying. Um, and so I think that's, that's, those are some places that you can take a start, start at. I mean, it's a long conversation. I would say, number one, I want mosques to be more interactive, more open to engaging with churches, with synagogues, with colleges, with schools, because that's really important. Number two, uh, the communities in their neighborhoods. I just attended a program in Fairfax called A Taste of Islam. Fashion shows, women showing their fashion shows. Oh my God, people are so interested in this whole idea of hijab and, and you know, the different million fashions in, in, in the Muslim world, as if there's only one. Henna, uh, food. It was quite amazing. 1,000 people turned out attending that event, A Taste of Islam. Social media is helpful. Georgetown University has a program uh, under the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. Every year, it trains about 300 to 400 teachers who teach social studies on, Islam, on, on Islamic history and Islamic civilization. The last point I want to make is we live in a country that we love, a country that values separation between state and religion. And because of that, our schools have become very sensitive to teaching about religion. And every time you say, let's talk about, oh my God, wait a minute, but that's a constitutional issue. So I think as a nation, we have to dialogue about what that really means and how can we engage everyone with all religions without compromising on that very important value that we have to hold on, 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 on to. Well, I also work with the Islamic Center of Maryland, so I'm with the interfaith, so we are having teaching out a lot of churches and synagogue and having a lot of uh, dialogue with them. And it, they're very open about these things. It's yes. They yes. continue with it. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, the other thing I think about as I listen to your question, too, is that in the absence of having the ability to have a conversation about how we do this in a way that gives privilege to everyone's lived experience, what we did then is take out the soul of everyone's lived experience and to say we're going to make them professional day, leave day, whatever the case may be. Because the harder work is to actually sit down and figure it out together and to recognize that we have to value each other's lived experience, to celebrate our borders, um, and to do that in a way that brings joy, but also recognition. And, and I find that's often an easy space that many of us go to. Instead of actually having the difficult conversation that we need to have, we try to sterilize it and san sanitize it and just make it this for everybody. Other questions, observations? Because y'all know I go back to my list, you won't get back in for a while. Don't be shy, come forward. And I say the dumb question is the question you don't ask. Meaning don't be shy, just be open. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, good evening, I, I wanted to maybe get your recommendations or suggestions. I think we're all pretty privileged to live in a pretty diverse area of the country, and I'm wondering what strategies do you think might be helpful in creating those opportunities to listen to each other in areas that maybe are more rurally isolated or, or areas that do not have the diversity that we see here in Montgomery County or in the Washington, D.C. metro area? So, thank you, Mylan. Mylan, actually, I want to give a shout out. She is my our program director uh, for Asian American Lead. Um, so I think this is the tough question. This is, this is the million dollar question about how do we access or connect with those individuals. Um, for myself, they're not in my friend circle. Um, I work at Asian American Lead. They're not really in my, in my context. And, and most of the times when I encounter people uh, who have different perspectives, it's, it's on the street or 
um, being stopped by police or, um, you know, in those situations where, where it's tense. Um, I think it's, it's, it's continuing to, to have dialogues like this, uh, to, to, to put that, that messaging out there. Uh, it's it's going to be a slow process. This took a long time uh, to develop this, and, and so uh, it's engaging. I think, um, you know, Montgomery College is hosting this, I think promoting it with the other community colleges um, that are in Maryland, uh, promoting it to uh, a Hagerstown Community College and saying, well, this is what we did. Would you be interested in doing something similar to this? Uh, promoting it to the, the other universities. So within uh, the realm that, that you exist is, is to be able to have those conversations. I and mean, then just leading by example, I think continuing to, to, to promote this messaging uh, that's out there, show that compassion, uh, finding those allies to really promote that messaging uh, out there. Uh, and so, you know, I always talk about the model minority myth, and whenever I go talk about Asian American lead, uh, if I have a 30-minute conversation, uh, I go in there with a whole prepared speech of, okay, I'm going to talk about Asian American lead, this is what we do, and all that, and I never get past that people don't realize they're low-income Asian Americans. Uh, and, and so just continuing to go out there and having those conversations, whoever, whoever is out there, uh, and finding those commonalities, finding, I think this is, this is something that, that we really need to work on, where are they coming from? What is their experience? And so whenever I go meet with someone, uh, hopefully, you know, if it's a, it's a prepared meeting, I do a lot of research on them to be able to find what is that one thing that we can connect on. Um, sometimes it's family. Uh, sometimes it's, it's food. Uh, you know, and once you get that, that trust, uh, I think you can open up the conversation. Um, and then it's always being, being respectful. I think when you have these conversations, it's, it's, it's being compassionate and, and being calm. And I think not everyone can do it. Um, you'll get into conversations where people will just come and, and talk down to you. Um, we just had a, we just went out to, um, to Union Market and it's something that's been actually not bothering me the, the whole day is that um, we were there doing a staff just retreat and we were just, I, I, we all got together just hang out and do some team building and um, there was a couple that came up to us. Um, we're sitting around clapping, we're making some announcements uh, and they came up to us, what seemed innocent, um, and they said, well, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing here? Um, I feel like either you're going to bust out into a cultural dance or um, you're going to have an uprising. And those are the only two options that those individuals saw that we could do as a group. Um, and so those are, I think, opportunities to be able to then calmly talk about what we do, how we support low-income Asian Americans, uh, and, and start the conversation there. Um, they eventually went off and we couldn't engage in that conversation, but I think maybe then they have a sense now that they'll say, oh, well, you know, maybe are you going to do a cultural dance, an uprising, or are you a youth-serving organization? <laughs> um, uh, but I think those, those types of, of small conversations is starting those, um, and, it's, and it's a long process, I think. I would say there's no one single strategy, number one. Number two, um, I talked to you about things Clergy Beyond Borders has done. A few years ago, we had a 14-passenger van. We painted it with one arc, one Maryland. We are all in this together. And we had a group of clergy from different religions on that van. We started in Ocean City, and we crossed our entire state from the far east to the far west. And in between, we met in temples and synagogues and churches and mosques. We met with teachers, with clergy, with media outlets, with NGOs. We met in coffee shops, in clinics, in hospitals. It was a quite revealing for those who saw us months and priests and rabbis and imams working in a, in a clinic in, in, in uh, uh, Cumberland for four hours till almost 11 o'clock p.m. They never saw in that community a priest and a pastor working together, let alone a rabbi and imam and a Catholic pastor. Just like a joke. It sounds like a joke. No way can it happen. They saw us. They saw us uh, working in a 
in a park cleaning it up in Ocean City. For me, that's a strategy. The idea was to build a network of citizens of Maryland who know how to work together and the value of working together. At Georgetown University, every Tuesday, we bring together students from different religious backgrounds to prepare sandwiches together. They prepare 200 to 300 sandwiches every week and together deliver them to a local homeless shelter. The impact of that program for now 10 years on people who are, who are now diplomats, who are now working in the Congress, who are now working in NGOs nationwide and internationally has been beyond imaginations. A few years ago, I took a group of medical school and law school Muslim students to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where there has been anti-Muslim movement. And Muslims said, really? They're not going to welcome us. I said, that's why, why we're going there. And we're not going to go there to preach Islam. We're going to go there to build, to rebuild a church that was destroyed because of a hurricane. And we went. We worked together when it was snowing badly from Sunday to Sunday. We worked with a local homeless shelter to raise money. They never ever were able to raise more than $10,000. They raised $125,000 that day. Muslims brought about a new life to the city. They now welcomed us to pray at the church with them. The impact of that relationship, the lasting impact on Chattanooga, Tennessee, Muslim-Christian relation was never ever expected, but it's happening. You need to conquer your fear of the other, that's the strategy. You need to reach out, that's the strategy. You need to reclaim a cul an American culture of compassion, that's the strategy. Clergy Beyond Borders is working on a one year, 10 caravans to 10 states. And we will carry, hopefully, at least 500 clergy throughout the year to actually go to these areas where there have been issues about the other and about difference, to say, let's reclaim a culture of compassion where we are passionately engaging with compassion for our beautiful America. That's the strategy. It's not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to ever end. It's an ongoing process. The more you do, the more you realize you need to do more. Both of you talked about this idea of disrupting someone's perceptions about the other, whether that be we're giving them a third option about what you could be doing in a location or giving them multiple options of thinking about how groups can come together to work. Um, and I see no other questions. So I'll give you all the opportunity uh, to end our conversation today by, um, it wasn't a question I posed to you, but it's one that I'm actually working on a, a commencement speech on. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about Americanism. What does it mean to be an American in this day and age? And how do we advance that idea of Americanism? I can start. So when I, my parents immigrated here in the 1960s, they went, immigrated to um, Kentucky. Uh, in the 1960s, there were the only two Indian Americans who went, who went to the University of Kentucky. Um, one of the things they always tell me about it during the 60s, Kentucky basketball was great, and they went to every single basketball game and now they wouldn't take me to any basketball games. Um, one of the things they talked about is, is that um, there was a community. There was something called community at that time. And um, maybe they didn't see the racism that was going on um, to them, but they talked about the compassion of people and neighbors. And they talked about um, this Americanism about helping people. And so my dad was looking for, for a job. Um, and he became a mechanic. Some, someone just said, oh, you know, come work for me. Um, while you go to school, I'll, I'll be, be a mechanic. Um, and he passed that down on to me. Um, and, you know, we used to take family trips back to Kentucky, and I'd be like, 
you know, who are these? Are they relatives? Or do we have this secret white family somewhere that, <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know about in, in our history? Um, you know, but I think, I think at the time uh, for them, there, there was something about that we belong to a neighborhood, we belong to a community. Uh, and so I try to recreate that. I now live in Arlington and none of my neighbors talk to me. Um, you know, we were all scared of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, we don't say, you know, we'll wave from across the street or when we're in our cars, we, we'll wave and then go into our garage and then come into the house and uh, no one's outside on, on the porch hanging out or, uh, you know, grabbing a drink together. And so I think we've really lost what community means mm -hmm. and, and what, we mean, what, what it means to be uh, American, uh, what it means, means to be uh, together. Um, you know, I think that the 60s obviously were, were not a great time, but there are pockets where th there were neighborhoods, there were, there were communities. Um, you know, and, and the challenge there was they were all segregated communities. And so you had a Chinatown, but they were a neighborhood. Uh, Chinatowns are moving away. Um, you know, we can look in this, is, this area. Uh, there are rich uh, black neighborhoods in, in the city. They're no longer there. Um, and so kind of bringing that, bringing back now this new identity and, and new idea of community, but it's not just one group. Uh, it's multiple groups living together. Um, you know, just on my street, the, the, the uh, neighbors across the street is an African-American male and, and a white woman. Uh, and then we have a Pakistani neighbor. Uh, and then we have a retired um, uh, Pentagon employee. Uh, and then we have an uh, Asian American and a, and a white male. But we don't talk to each other, but we have so much in common. Um, and so we've tried to start, tried to start doing that. I've, you know, when, the, when it snowed, I, everyone got out together and I just brought a couple beers. I said, oh, let's just have some beers out here and talk. Uh, just talk and, and connect with each other. Um, and so I think it's, re it's really bringing back that idea of, of what the ideal America was or what people saw, what immigrants saw coming in mm. and making that a reality. Um, you know, what, what was being portrayed uh, about the good things about America and, re and, and trying to figure out ways um, to make that, that the truth. You were born in America. I was born in India. In India? Yes. How old were you when you came? Came at three. My parents couldn't decide whether they liked India or America better, so we went back every year. Mm. I was born elsewhere. I signed up to become an American. I signed up because I knew of something called an American dream. I signed. I remember the moment when I was sworn in, in a big ceremony in San Antonio, Texas. Tears in my eyes, eyes by the person next to me who was laughing, crazily laughing, oh my God, he's becoming a citizen, why are you crying? I said, never felt like a human being. Because I came from a background, I lived under an occupation. I lived without a citizenship, and I traveled without an actual passport. So to become a citizen for the first time is great. And now I can pursue the American dream. I was so happy, so delighted. I felt like, God, it's a new life, born again, American. In the last few years, to say the truth, I have been wondering about that dream I signed on to. Mm -hmm. Not that I gave up on the dream, I'm still proud of the dream I signed on to. But is the dream fading away? Is the dream leaving us American? And I hope not. I hope not because we teach our kids to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
American, my friend, is when America becomes a true refuge for all. Regardless of religion, of color of skin, of class, of name, of label. When no one is asked to identify himself or herself by the label given to them. Because in my tradition it teaches Allah or God does not judge you by how you look, but rather what resides in your heart. Not the color of your skin, by rather the content of your character. Martin Luther said that, but Muhammad said that word by word 1400 years ago. So for me, I want to see an America that is open for all, an America whose table does not exclude any, regardless of his or her identity. And America, and I say this, what happened so many years ago, hear ye, hear ye, my beloved America. Continue to be America by opening your doors for immigrants, we are all immigrants. Continue to stand up for justice for all. Stand up, speak up, speak for those who have been left behind. I say to America, my America, if you are a Christian, that's what Jesus would want you to do. Feed the hungry in order to feed and be in the presence of Jesus. And if you are Jewish, tikkun ulam, the very well-known Jewish concept of justice, forces you to vow yourself to a world that is perfect at its core. If you are Muslim, the concept of adl and justice is at the core of Islam. If you are Hindu, if you are Buddhist, at both of these traditions, the idea of you must not judge others because you don't want others to judge you must shape America. So I'm sorry for speaking too long, but what America is, what Americanism for me is, speak the truth. For when one is alienated in any neighborhood in America, the entire country should have the desire and the full determination to stand up for him here or them. Injustice anywhere, it has led to justice everywhere, but also alienating one is alienating all. At the same time, empowering one is empowering the American Hallelujah. A dream. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to thank my guests so deeply <clears throat> for their participation here today. Um, I, this series has been uh, soul food for me uh, since we started it. This idea of bringing people together uh, to engage in conversations that may make us uncomfortable, conversations that engage us, that excite us, that make us laugh, and also uh, want sometimes move us to cry. That that's the part about being an American uh, that I think is the potency of power, a potency of stories, the narrative is there. Um, and I wanna thank you all for being here today and thank the audience. Uh, you all were engaged from the minute they opened their mouth to the moment they stopped, and I'm so grateful for that. I also want to take the opportunity to thank our sponsors who helped put this series on. Uh, we are thinking about uh, how to do this again next year, and we want to thank those who've been on this journey with us. Uh, the Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber of Commerce, the Healthcare Initiative Foundation, Holy Cross Health Leadership Montgomery, Montgomery County Faith Advisory Council, they need to be on your, your van, <laughs> Montgomery County Office of Human Rights, the Rockville Chamber of Commerce, and the universities of Shady Grove. I want to thank you all for choosing to be here. We welcome your feedback about this series as we look to put together a platform for next year and hope that you'll choose to be a part of it again. Thank you all so much. Please visit the table in the back. Somebody sent me a book 
and a set of CDs aside, please. And I will look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. about the power of dialogue and, and how we came to be about in uh, Montgomery College. So we have a program now in Montgomery College, and this really started with a dialogue with, with Dr. Pollard about Asian American youth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we talk about, you know, we have this dialogue now, and, and what can result in dialogue? What happens? What's the next step? Uh, and so my previous, um, the previous executive director, you know, had attended a couple meetings, talked to Dr. Pollard about you know, what's going on with Asian American youth at the university? What are the resources available out there? Uh, there was open conversation and real reflection on what is Montgomery College doing with Asian American youth? What are the outcomes? Uh, and then a will to move forward to support those uh, Asian American youth. Um, and, and, and working with youth, we always get so proud of when they have accomplishments. And, and one of our youth, uh, Megan, um, who, didn't think that um, she could be eligible for the Hillman Entrepreneurship Program. <laughs> um, she had seen it. She'd seen it many times. She, she was in, in the university, she'd seen it many times, but just didn't ap never apply. She said, this is not for me. I can never apply for this. Hmm. Um, you know, maybe she was too busy and, and couldn't make it to some of the resources. Uh, but it, wasn't only, it was only because of the support and, and will of Dr. Pollard that we were able to uh, have programs here and really say, you know what, you can do this. Um, you know, this, these are the different requirements. You can go ahead and apply. And she was able to secure that, uh, that program. Uh, and, and for her, it's really changed her life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just today we learned that she's now um, completing her, her time here and transferring to the University of Maryland. Um, <laughs> And so I, I just wanted to really uh, thank Dr. Pollard um, you know, for engaging us in dialogue and engaging in dialogue about uh, a challenge that the university had and, and then moving forward and, and changing that into, into action. So well, thank, thank you. Well, thank you so much. And that just made my day. going to make me cry. I, love to hear, <laughs> I do. I love to hear about the students. And they're the reason we do this work. So thank you all so much. Thank you all. Have safe travels home. Thank you. For the books. Take as many copies as you want. Give them away to your friends. Ah. Yes, take as many as you want. For the CDs, someone will be there to get, again, $10 per seven CDs. That's a very good deal. That's a very good deal. Oh, my God. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you so much. Yes.